I'll wait for your cue, right, Jonathan? You're live now, Prof. Hi, good evening from Malaysia and good everything else from uh, all parts of the world. I welcome all of you to our uh, second Let's Talk ID series. And it is uh, my pleasure today to welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Ed Robeck. Okay, he is the Director of Education and Outreach at the American Geosciences Institute. Uh, Ed, uh, I've known Ed and we have known each other for more than 10 years now. I first met Ed when he came to Malaysia as a Fulbrighter and we worked together on many projects. And we have been working ever since then on various projects uh, ever since. Um, Ed, as I know him, uh, he's a very giving and, uh, and a very compassionate person and never say no to us you know he's always there to support uh, our initiatives yeah uh, it comes with um, a lot of experience in uh, curriculum design in fact his phd is from the university of British columbia and he is professor emeritus at, from salisbury university um so Ed is going to share with us um, his um, ideas about uh, virtual rea different realities and how do we use instructional design to design this into our lessons. Yeah. So that is a, a, a quick brief uh, on Ed. And later, I'm sure our moderator today, Dr. Y, who was our first speaker, will, will share more about uh, Ed uh, with us. And why, if you all were with us on the first series, you will know that uh, he is actually an accredited hand surgeon, medical educator, and an instructional designer. I have also known why for many years, and we, we all continue to, to share our instructional design experiences and knowledge and skills with uh, as many people as possible. So again, it is um, our pleasure, my pleasure, a pleasure from the Asia Pacific University to host uh, this program today. And uh, we hope you will listen in and uh, have some uh, nice questions or comments to share with us and also your experiences to share with us. Thank you very much. And I pass it over to um, Y. Thank you, Prof. Opta. It's uh... Great honor and privilege to be here. I'd like to thank the uh, APU, Asia Pacific University, for asking me to moderate. Um, I've known Prof. Apta uh, for a long time. Uh, she was my mentor in instructional design. And uh, I also, it's a great honor to uh, moderate with Dr. Ed Robeck, who was also my uh, uh, lecturer during my instructional design uh, learning days. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, I am very biased towards instructional design and technology in the sense that I believe that it's one of the soft skills for all faculty. Uh, in healthcare profession, we define faculty as anybody involved in the teaching of others. And in today's uh, work-based environment and community-based learning, uh, everybody is a faculty member. And so instructional design is one of the soft skills that is needed for every, uh, for all people uh, who are involved in the teaching of others. And Dr. Ed Robeck, uh, as Prof. Apta has mentioned, is currently the Director of Education and Outreach at the American Geoscience Institute, uh, is a scientist by uh, training, but also has taken education very seriously. And he's been in faculty development programs and his research has been in the use of curriculum and instructional design uh, for the development of curriculum and faculty development. And he has spent a lot of time and research into this area. And uh, it's really a great pleasure to invite him uh, today. And his talk is going to uh, concentrate on the use of instructional design to connect virtual reality with real world experience and as we in this current environment uh, where remote uh, learning is becoming more and more uh, common, we need to have a connect and a hybrid in how we could use technology 
to learn knowledge and develop skills and then putting them into practice in the real world. So I look forward to that. And uh, Dr. Ed Robeck, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Vaya. Thank you, Prof. Abtar, for inviting me to be a speaker at this important series. Instructional design is something that many of us take very seriously, especially in these days when we're challenged by so many things to make sure that instruction continues to be strong and effective. I wanna share with you today some ideas that were developed by a team of instructional designers and educators that I work with over the past several years. Even before the pandemic, we began working with virtual contexts uh, in which students especially can design and work with ideas and develop their own ideas about, some, about the places that they're exploring. We all have an idea that real world contexts can contribute a lot to learning, whether those are indoor contexts in specialized places such as a NASA lab, or that there are outdoor places such as engineering outside in a geoscience setting. But there are a number of things that can lead to those places being unavailable to us from funding, time, the, how close we are to them, whether we can actually get access to the site and whether or not the people who are with us are all able-bodied and can, the site can be made accessible to them. There are also health and safety concerns and of course the pandemic. So the question became for us and for many people, what instructional design principles can be applied to virtual contexts to support experiences in real world settings? That is the idea here is that in some cases we can still get to the settings, in some cases we can't. In some cases we can get to the settings but not for enough of the time that we would like to be able to use them in instruction. So what can virtual contexts do to support that? I'm going to share with you five major themes today, each very briefly, but then I'm going to provide resource lists at the end of my talk that you can go to to find more information and some ideas about how to conduct instructional design processes for these themes. These are place-based education, the idea of novelty space, the learning theory behind learning from media, what's referred to as generative learning, and a framework that some of us have developed, some of us actually on this presentation have developed called the SCALED framework, which is a framework for meta-knowledge in instructional design. I'd like you all to think about a place that's meaningful to you. Imagine for a moment that you are there. How does it feel to you to be there? What is it that makes that place special to you? Just for a moment, I'd like you to think about this. When I do this activity with students live, I will often have them type into the chat the place they're thinking of and what makes it meaningful to them. Many times these are places that have to do with their families or their friends. It might be a place where they learned something special or where they had a special experience. And this idea of thinking about places and using places is important. And the idea of place is very central to the ideas that I'm sharing today. So for example, if we think about this place, we can imagine how this place feels to us. I'm going to ask us all now to go to a Jamboard, just as I would with students in my real instruction in my live instruction, and I'm going to put that Jamboard on screen. I believe that Jonathan is going to share that, um, that link with you. I'm, there we are. Hopefully the Jamboard will load. A Jamboard is essentially an electronic whiteboard that allows us to take notes. Looks like we're having, a. there we go. I believe you can see that now. And you may know that, some of you may know that over here are post-it notes. You can click on this icon right in the center here and get a sticky note. And you can write on that sticky note and you can respond to these questions that are up here. And I see several people coming in. I'd ask those people if they can to please go ahead and post a note to respond to the questions. What do you notice about this place? 
How does it make you feel? And what questions might you ask? Now, I know people are, are on a lot of different technologies, so it may not be possible for us to actually conduct this Jamboard today, but you can see that as we start to think about this place, we go beyond the fact that it's a beautiful physical setting and we start to think about it in other ways. And by thinking about it in those ways, we start to imagine ourselves there and what it might mean to us. And this is really the, the idea of the Jamboard. So I'm gonna keep moving on. I don't see people posting and it might not be possible. I'm just not sure. Oh, there we go. Sunset secluded, thank you. I'm not sure who posted that. But you can see that the Jamboard will start to fill up over time and students can start to share ideas. I'm gonna move on because the idea that we have here is that when we think about the word place, it can mean many different things. In this context, it means something very specific. The idea of placemaking is an innate human tendency. It begins with the indigenous habit, inhabitants of a place and continues with successive inhabitants. The meaning of place is that a place is any location that we give meaning to, usually by means of direct experience, but not always. It can be real, it can be remote, virtual, or imaginary. You can all imagine Hogwarts. Many of us have heard about the Harry Potter books, of course, and that place has a lot of meaning to a lot of people. The other thing about places is that they can be any size or scale. It can be something as small as a small cave or nook in the rocks. It can be something the size of a whole city. They can be natural or they can be built. As long as we're giving the meaning, they are what we refer to as a place. There are key concepts in place-based education, place meaning, place attachment, and sense of place. And people imbue many places with many kinds of meanings. And these are negotiated through time by different people and cultures. People make both intellectual and emotional connections to places. They know the place intellectually, but they also have a feeling for the place. Together, these constitute what is known as our sense of place. And these may be based on a wide, wide range of different values, as in this list here. So this diagram shows us schematically what we mean. The place meanings and place attachments make up our sense of place. And sense of place is very important to how we feel about learning in a place and learning about a place. Because place meanings and place attachments can also be negative. You can imagine a place where you, you might have had a bad experience. The place meaning there might be actually an aversion to the place and your sense of place may be negative. In place-based education, we strive to support students developing a positive sense of place. By developing a positive sense of place, we add, lend authenticity to instructional experiences and support learning outcomes. By supporting learning outcomes, we develop that positive sense of place that allows students to learn well there and achieve the goals that they're working toward in their learning, that the experiential education is focused on. And the sense of place enhances that motivation for both students and teachers. So we apply place-based education through authentic experiences that support learning outcomes, develop a positive sense of place, prepare the learner for activities in similar settings, enhance motivation, and promote pro-environmental attitudes and behaviors in both the built and natural places. And when this occurs in the student's community, this is community-based instruction, which empowers community members, develops a sense of place that the community has value and encourages civic engagement and also instills stewardship. The environment of a place contains a spirit. The ambiance of a physical space influences our lives and our emotions directly. It's reasonable to conclude that aesthetics can enhance the teaching and learning environment. 
that is how the place looks and feels to us can affect our learning. But what can affect learning negatively is something called novelty space. This is a term that's used to refer to the dimensions of experience of students and learners when they enter a space and they may develop an anxiety or they may have other negative feelings about the place, often because of unfamiliarity. You can see the child on the left covering her face. You can imagine how she feels. You can see the students on the right standing back and feeling, and you can imagine the feelings that they're having. There are many novelty space. These can be cognitive novelty. These can be psychological novelty, geographic novelty, and social novelty. Cognitive novelty has to do with whether or not the learner feels like they understand enough to learn from the field experience. Sometimes students go into a field experience not understanding enough and they feel inadequate and that makes them feel anxious and that uncertainty can undermine their learning. As can psychological novelty of not knowing enough about the place, about what they're going to be doing, where they might even be eating. And these days, very important to many students, is will they even be able to use their smartphone and have Wi-Fi connectivity? Those kinds of things can affect student learning. The geographic novelty of where the place is, have they been there before? How far is it? How do they get there? And the social novelty of how is, what is going to be like, will their friends be there? Will there be other people that are like them? Will they like the people that are there? All of these things can affect learning. Enhancing familiarity with these dimensions can support learning in places. I have two examples of virtual contexts that I'm going to share with you now. And I'm going to switch screens a little bit to show you one of them. I think this one will flow pretty smoothly. This is a hospital setting. And not all of these need to be uh, this immersive, but I'm going to use these immersive environments just as examples. This is a children's hospital. And we're going inside now. And you can imagine that a child going into a hospital or even an intern going into a hospital can feel quite anxious about that place and what it'll be like when they get there. By allowing them to explore the virtual space in a place-based learning manner, that sense of place can be developed. And we can see that this is a very positive kind of place. We can also imagine that if someone is going to be working with some of the technology that's in this place, they might feel anxious about what their role might be, how they might be able to do use the technology effectively. And so we can use this to take them to that technology and then start to show them where they'll be getting information, what the screens mean, what the technology is going to do, what they'll be, it will be like for them to be in the space as either an intern or patient going into the space. These kinds of <clears throat> virtual settings allow us to explore and we can structure that for students so that they develop a sense of place in these settings. Now, one of the things that we are working to as well, this team that I'm working with, are outdoor spaces. As was mentioned earlier, I am the Director of Education and Outreach at the American Geosciences Institute. And this allows us to work in many different outdoor settings. I'm going to go to one now. Some of you may recognize that. It's a fairly famous place in the United States. My Google Earth is loading.
excuse me for just a moment. I had it pulled up, but it is not coming up on screen. Well, okay, it is loading now. I'm going to move it over so you can see it. It's a little rough. I think my bandwidth is being challenged a little bit by the presentation today. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute because the screen has gone black. And I'm going to try again. Um, and now I'm unable to share my screen. Jonathan, are you seeing a screen right now that you can share of mine? I think we might almost be there. Excuse the interruption. Okay, I think now we're seeing a landscape. I'm going to go back to the beginning. It jumped ahead a bit with all of the, the button pushing, I think. And hopefully it will show us a map. And even if we just read down, oh, here we go. So this is the United States. This is where I am, Salisbury, Maryland. All the way across the country is Mount St. Helens, which is the site that we're going to visit. This is a created virtual field trip that was developed by my colleague, Aida Awad, who's one of the consultants who works with our team developing these principles of instructional design. This was designed around geoheritage, which is a concept that connects people with the history of the land and the land with the history of the people. And as we go to this site, we can see many different aspects of the site and we can explore what it might mean to different people. I'm going to go ahead and let it load. So one of the things that we explore is how the place got its name and how it has been perceived 
at different times by different peoples. In this case, Native Americans had a different name for this mountain. It wasn't Mount St. Helens. One name was Luit, the other was Luala Claw. And these names had to do with, in their language, with the smoke that was seen coming out of the mountain. We can see that people have also perceived the mountain in art, <clears throat> in different ways. And this is what more like what the mountain would have looked like before 1980 in that painting. People have also done art with the mountain, with the volcanic ash that is on the sides of the mountain since the eruption in 1980. And they've made glass and other art <clears throat> objects out of that, uh, that ash. So this starts to give us a sense that this is more than just a mountain or more than just a volcano. It's a place that people think of aesthetically as well. We can also then, if we're talking about a place that's far away from the students, we can also ask them to start to think about how the places that they have been to or that they live have been named. How did the place that you live get its name, for example? A lot of times there's a lot of history and a lot of society, social history built into the naming of places. This project or this tour is created on a platform called Google Earth, which many of you may know. And some of the things that we ask students, and this is something that students can create themselves, and that's important to the work that we are doing. We can start to ask students how they might get to a place, how far it is, so they get geographically oriented to the place because again, that novelty space of where the place is and how it relates to their own geography helps them to become familiar with it and helps to break down some of that anxiety that they might have. We can look at the volcanoes in this range of mountains. There are many of them. You can see the red triangles and we can see the last time they erupted. We can talk to the students about the data about the eruptions, the frequency of the eruptions and so data becomes something that we can also use in a place-based education way to help students become familiar with the locations that they might be studying. Data can be cut, can be in many sources, excuse me, many from many sources and can take many forms. And we can start to then go to places where there are what are called photospheres that allow us to look around in the place and think about how it feels to be here and what some of our questions might be about this place and how it started, it has emerged. Why, for example, there is so much bare ground here, why the plants are so small and some of the things that might've happened to make this place look the way it does. Mount St. Helens is often used as an example of many different things, a stratovolcano, eruptions, what are called the hars or flows of melted material mixed with ash, the volcanic gases. We often use it as an example of topographic mapping as well. And we can use those examples, build those into our virtual context so that the students can explore those. So I'm gonna leave Mount St. Helens now, even though there's more here. The link to this tour is in the PowerPoint that I believe will be posted with this presentation. Ah, I'm back to the Jamboard and look at how much people have done here. And this is really helpful. I appreciate the work that people are doing to add things to this. Um, somebody asked, where is this? This is Mount St. Helens, how can we get here? Uh, depending on where you are, but that's the kind of question. I'm so glad that was asked because that's the kind of question that we do ask then when we are working with students in a place-based education manner. 
And there is learning theory behind place-based education and behind the approach that we take. And this model is something that if we just take the right-hand three rectangles, this is referred to as information processing theory. And we add to this the instructional media. A way to realize what this is thinking about or the, uh, intending to convey is to think about something like, imagine the feeling of the chair that you're sitting on right now. Now it's very likely that bef until I said that, until I asked you to think about it, you weren't paying attention to that chair or how it felt to sit on it or the clothing that you might be wearing, how they feel around your body. There are many different sensory inputs that we experience constantly and we filter many of them, if not most of them, away and we just don't attend to them. Part of instructional design is finding a way to bring into attention and perception the things that we want students to attend to and then finding ways for them to go beyond just attending to them and start to work with them in terms of building ideas. And then as they build ideas, they'll be retrieving information from long-term memory and integrating information, new information into long-term memory. And that's what we refer to as meaningful learning because then that information, that knowledge is available to be applied in new situations. One of the ways that we do this in this, the work that we're doing with place-based education in instructional design is through storyboarding. We actually advocate for having students create the projects like you just saw with Mount St. Helens, having them decide what photos to use, what cultural attributes to highlight, to identify the location in multiple different ways, what data to include, and how to connect it to the curriculum. And then they can pick specific points of interest that they can focus on and take the tour of and take their project and focus on those in their tour. And then within those points of interest, they can do the same thing. And they can start to think about how they might narrate the scene and how they might convey the ideas to others who might be using the tour that they're creating. And it's that transformation of ideas from their mind to images, to data, to written work. All of those transformations are what help to solidify the learning and move it into long-term memory. This is what's referred to as generative learning. That is, generative learning emphasizes the active role of the learners in sense-making. Um, I just saw a pop-up, excuse me. <laughs> um, they organize existing and new ideas into coherent structures, integrate the new ideas into long-term memory and apply synthesized ideas into new situations. This is what we mean by generative learning and instructional design. And the student here is empowered to be at the center of that and to make many decisions more or less independently. These are some of the strategies that can be used in generative learning. We allow students to select, modify, transform, combine, integrate, and otherwise engage with the media that they're using in the virtual context that they're creating. They might create a concept map. They might make a drawing of their ideas. They might summarize those ideas in a written report or an oral, excuse me, in an oral summary of the material through a narration. All of these strategies can lead them to understand the place in multiple different ways and to become familiar with it in a way that diminishes that negative novelty space. And notice that some of these on the far right are internal representations. That is the student is thinking about things and imagining or building their knowledge internally. And other times it's they are external representations. Some of you may have heard the name Lev Vygotsky and know something about what's referred to as social constructivism. Many theorists believe that students need to express their knowledge to other peers that they value or other people they value before it's validated as knowledge that they will retain. So those external representations can become very important in the learning process. 
So this is what that artic that model looks like in the instance that I've used today. I showed you an image of the mountain, which you may have just forgotten. You may have looked at it and thought it was a pretty picture and then let it go out of your mind immediately. So that it was in sensory memory for a moment, but sensory memory is very short lived. We have to get students to pay attention to things and start to think about them in various ways. And I did that today through a Jamboard, which many of you, thank you, have been adding to and looking at and connecting with other ideas and questions that you have. And now I'm going to also introduce something called the scaled framework. This is the long version, which I put in the PowerPoint so that when you access it, you have some of the ideas. But the scaled framework recognizes that something like a single lesson or a single virtual context is just part of a larger program of instructional design. The scaled framework addresses some of the most important dimensions of what's referred to as meta-knowledge about the instructional design program or the program that is being designed. This is a shorter version, and I might go back and forth a little bit between the two, but the idea of stakeholders is, uh, that should be who, excuse me, who cares about the program and what are their interests? Often when we're designing lessons, we think primarily about the students that we're working with, which is appropriate, but there may be other stakeholders for whom the learning is very important. It might be that the students are learning some medical skill or some navigational skill in the out of doors. The people who they will be working with are their stakeholders who will have a stake, that is, they'll have an interest in how well those students learn those things. That's something for an instructional designer to pay attention to as they are thinking about the lessons in the program that they're working with. The capacities, that is, what is, are the new, the knowledge and skills, the habits of mind that the students are to be learning? We often think of these as objectives, but we all, can also think of these in terms of the community of practice and we, one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is how were these chosen? Which capacities are we developing and for what reasons in this particular setting? The affordances refers to the technology that's being used, why and how, and how it was selected. We often use technology, computer technology, because of its visual appeal. We can see things, we can talk to each other. But in the case that I just showed you, the technology also allows students to assemble different pieces of data, different images, different media into a coherent pro project that they can then use to express their ideas to others. Those are important to think about as we're thinking about the instructional design program. The learner characteristics, that is what the students come in with. There can also be a type of novelty space in technology itself. When someone starts working with technology, they can often be anxious about whether their skills will be enough to get them through the project effectively. There are ways to support those students. And there are also ways to know that the students who are coming in already have some basic skills that they might need. Those are important things to know. Excuse me. Those are important things to know as we are doing the, the, the design of the program. Sometimes when we think about evaluation, we think primarily about how the student will be evaluated in the course. But we can also think about how the program of instruct the program that we're working with, the larger scheme in which the lesson, the course fits, how that will be evaluated and how the individual assignments or the individual courses factor into that larger scale evaluation. And also why the instruction design program is designed the way that it is. That is those design intentions. Is it interactive? Is it something that we are doing that's more passive for the student? Are we empowering the students? Are we making using generative learning? Are we not using generative learning? Why are we doing the things the way we are? These ideas in the scaled framework can be applied to place-based education. 
And these become important because as we start to think about place-based education, we realize that many different people imbue places with meanings and attachments, and those people become our, our stakeholders. In the United States, we are paying a lot of attention as we study places and as we work with places to the Native American history that is there and some of the rights that they have to how the place is treated. We're, that's just an example. In terms of capacities, we, are, we have to think about why are we using this place and how will being in that place enhance what the students learn? We can choose other places. I chose Mount St. Helens. I could have chosen someplace closer to myself, or I could have chosen someplace closer to you. Why are those choices made the way they are? Sometimes it's good to have someplace that's close, so it's community-based learning. Sometimes it's better to have someplace that's farther away because then there's a novelty and an interest that develops around that. We can also think about how the technology can be used to develop a positive sense of place. As I showed with the hospital, we think we, some people think about hospitals as places where sick people go, where people go when they're injured. So there's a negative kind of a connotation with hospitals. But in the example that I showed, you can see it as a positive place, a place where people see positive benefit to their experience there. We can also look at the related place meetings and attachments the students come with. Do they already know the place? Have they been to the place where they're going to do their experiential education that we might be connecting to in the virtual spaces that we're working with? If they have not been there, it might be that we need to familiarize them with the space so that novelty space impact that we have, the anxiety does not emerge. If they have been there, we need, might need to assess what kind of experiences they've had, whether they have a positive, um, whether they have a positive experience there or not already, and how we might need to deal with that as we assess them and move forward with the instruction. And then how will the quality of the student's experiences and the sense of place be assessed, not just in the individual lesson, but overall in the program? If they're going to do experiential learning in a place, it's probably large, part of a larger program. And what role does that experience have in that program? And then why are the experiences in the places designed the way they are? What are the things that the students are to get out of those and in what ways do they need to interact in the place in order to get those outcomes that they're looking for? So this scaled framework allows us to think through instructional design in a broader level using this meta knowledge so that we can think about things and how the lessons and the units that we're talking about fit in and how the experiential learning fits in with the larger program as well as the virtual contexts. So in summary, virtual contexts support the development of a positive sense of place. They can diminish the negative effects of novelty space. When we're looking at learning in spaces and we can allow students to generate new knowledge themselves. And they can contribute to a broader programmatic, to the broader programmatic instructional design. So, Thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. I do want to share with you that in this PowerPoint, which um, I will clarify how it would be made available, I have the references that I've used and many of them have links to the papers and to the uh, resources. I wanna point out especially the web resources at the bottom here. Those are linked and there are many tools for place-based instructional design and for the design of virtual contexts for and by students. So I encourage you to visit those websites. Um, all of, well, two of them I've had a role in developing along with the team that I work with so that there are materials there that can make, help you put these things into practice. Again, thank you very much. And I'd be happy to have a discussion with anyone who has questions or comments. Thank you very much.
Ed, it was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Um, we have a few comments here. So I'm going to read one uh, from my good friend Raj Malhi. I hope he's still there. Hi, Raj. Uh, his co comments is amazing stuff, Ed. What would be a good starting point, tool, or platform for those interested in creating the virtual learning assets that you just shared? Thank you very much, Raj. Um, the, the platforms that we have been using primarily, there's, there are two of them. There's one called Esri. Esri is a, a company name. Esri Story Maps. And the one that I showed from Mount St. Helens is Google Earth Projects. The nice thing about Google Earth Projects is that immersive feel. One of the things that I didn't show just because I was a little intimidated by the, by the bandwidth issue is um, that in that there are um, places where you can go and you can click on what's called Pegman and you can see the images that others have taken and uploaded about the site. So often there are a lot of resources there already available in Google Earth that allow you to build virtual contexts or allow you to help students build virtual contexts themselves using Google Earth projects. Um, and then they can also collect things online as well or research them themselves. Uh, there's another question from Michael uh, Gwenty. Uh, he likes to know how to do the design assessment of a unique of, of instruction given that in place-based education, learners attribute different meaning to the place. This is a really good question, Michael. Thank you for that. One of the things that we have to think about within place-based education is, are there some things that all students need to get out of the learning and are the, it, and is also part of the intent that they develop a positive sense of place. There are assessments for sense of place that we can use. Um, there are actually organized assessments. And one of the people on the team that I referenced, Dr. Steve Semkin, has developed assessments. And that first activity that I didn't actually go through with you because we didn't have the, the chat enabled, um, where you think about a sense of place and you think about the meanings that you attach to it, and you think about the the um, <clears throat> the different attachments that you might have to that place, as you start studying the place, those might be very limited. And some of them might be negative. If we're looking for a positive sense of place, we would look for those to change through the course of the activity or of the experience so that they can add to that positive sense of place and the outcomes there. But if there are specific outcomes, as with any lesson, we would assess those as well, and we would expect that those would be enhanced because place-based education has been shown to motivate students to in the learning that they do and the place and about the place. It would be a matter then of focus and what kinds of focus do we bring and how do we bring that focus to the different topics that we want them to, to get out of that experience in the place. Those are good questions. Um, yeah, there's uh, another one uh, for preschoolers. The major content, uh, concern is attention span. And so they need to, you know, how to assist learning because parents may not have the knowledge of the time to assist. This is from Gurudip Saini. Gurudip, that's, that's a wonderful um, consideration. Um, I didn't put my email in uh, the, the, um, the presentation, but there, there are, um, let me just say, there, there has been work done with children in terms of place-based education, probably not having the children build the context in a virtual space, but there have been things done with children, for example, um, picture sorting kinds of activities where students can look at things and talk about which of these do you feel good about? How does this make you feel? And just getting the students, the children to express their ideas about the places um, and then talk to them about those places. So it may not be that the children, the preschoolers can use the virtual, can build the virtual context themselves, but the virtual context can be used to elicit their sense of place and to then have them reflect on that and develop that. And also as they share ideas between children, many of the children will have positive experiences in places like those that are being shown and those can be shared and they can help to develop the positive sense of place as well. 
Uh, there's another question from uh, Yogi Swaran. Uh, he's asking the comparing LMS and authoring tool, which one would be cost efficient during this pandemic time for remote learning? Um, I think that is beyond my scope to respond to. Um, the authoring tool, again, that, I, that um, I'm using for the virtual context primarily is Google Earth, and it is free. Um, it is one that you need to be able to get access to. And I know that in some places, access to Google tools might be limited. Um, but we have used Google Earth projects and Esri Story Maps um, with environmental educators, with teachers, with professors, and all of them have found it to be effective. Maybe I can just make a comment. Uh, sure. I think I think it's the LMS and the authoring tools are quite two different platforms. The LMS is mainly a distribution platform and to log the activities, uh, the distribution of resources and to log activities. Whereas the authoring tool is the creation of those uh, digital resources. And so they're, they're quite two different things. Uh, very few LMS have got incorporated high-end authoring tools. A lot of the authoring tools tend to have a very steep learning curve. I personally use Articulate because it's very rapid. It can easily produce within minutes a nice little uh, e-learning uh, program. Okay, then there's another uh, question from Swat. How can place-based learning be used as a framework to address issues of destructive students' behavior? towards school facilities? Oh, Suad, what a <laughs> wonderful question. Um, because um, as I said in one of my slides, uh, community-based education does, if it's done properly and effectively, it can lead to a sense of stewardship. Um, one of the questions that I would have, um, this is something that I think is a, is, is a wonderfully complicated answer, but something that I'd love to work with because the question is why would the students be destructive? Why would they be defacing the school? A lot of times in, when we look at vandalism, um, it's because the, the people in the place don't value the place or they don't see it as a valuable place. Their sense of place is negative and they may even feel demeaned by being there. So one of the things that we can start to do then is to help them see that the place that where they are has value and has had value through time to a number of different people to start to do start some of that, what I might call social archeology, span where we look at who has lived here? Why did they move here? What was their life like? Why did they value this place? These kinds of things. And to start understanding that history and maybe having the young people talk to elders, what we refer to as heritage keepers about their experiences in the place so they can start to see the value the place has and that it is worth preserving. Those are just some ideas, but it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to think about because a lot of community-based educators uh, are focused on how to get students in a position where they are working in a stewardship capacity in their own communities. Okay, uh, Jonathan, how, how long more do we have? I have one more question. Um, sure. Uh, how do you see the, this is from Semi Sem U. How do you see the approaches discussed being used to support students learning in the personalized learning environment? I think this is, uh, uh, Semi U, this is a wonderful question. And this is one where I think it's, it's really um, very effective. Um, interestingly, th that you asked the question in terms of individualized learning or personalized learning. Um, because, um, and those are not the same thing I know, um, but <clears throat> uh, many of the people that we work with with these techniques are struggling more. How can they do group work? How can they get groups working together? And that is one of the benefits of both Esri Story Maps and Google Earth Projects is they are fully collaborative platforms. So students can work on the same project together. Um, because often what happens is that um, teachers or educators, I should say, because we've worked with environmental educators in informal settings as well, will have students work individually on projects that are meaningful to them. And sometimes one of the, and somebody also asked about assessment, I think it was Michael. A lot of times in that case, uh, in personalized learning, students might set their own evaluation criteria. What is it that they're trying to achieve 
And then they would also then reflect on how they achieved that. Sometimes the teacher will have some number of assessment uh, components and they will let the students add another set to those so the student has some um, empowerment to decide what they want to learn out of the situation as well. That is uh, another interesting question from Supraya Singh is how do you design a session for something quite abstract like computer programming model, module? The, um, I would need to think about that and, and, and discuss that because the, you know, I can imagine that you would be, um, I'm trying to think about how place-based edge place the the, the 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 concept of place um, works in a totally digital environment like that where you're programming. Um, what is the what is the counterpart to place in that situation? Would it be a place in the programming? Would it be a place in um, the the output? Um, I would need to think about that because it it doesn't readily lend itself as I think about it. Um, I think there I would look more at how to demystify the technology to, I mean, that's, this is the first thing that comes to my mind is how to make the students comfortable and not have that novelty space effect with the technology as they start interacting with the new technology, the new programming languages that they're learning. But I'm guessing that that might be something that you're already addressing. It's a good question. It's an interesting question. Um, just looking at any other books, questions. Michael asked again about uh, is be more applicable in specific learning areas like sciences and what about the less in the more abstract areas? How, how would this be? I think it's quite similar to computer programming. Um, actually, in this case, I think I have a, a more of a response because Actually, place-based education, um, I approach it from a science point of view, and so my, um, my examples tend to be that direction. Um, but you can, as I showed with Mount St. Helens, the, the art, for example, that was done around Mount St. Helens, you could do uh, a, a whole um, uh, project just around the, the artistic and the social sorts of um, ideas that are related to the place. You can look at the history of the place, who's lived there, the music that's emerged, the art that's emerged, the food that's emerged in that place. And you can do the more social science kinds of things. You can also do the mathematics of the place. You can talk about measuring it. You can talk about the data that relate to it. Um, you can talk about how the place has changed and how that change has been monitored through mathematics for example. Those are just some examples, but um, where something can be related to a physical space, these ideas can be applied throughout the subject areas and have been. Uh, there's another question from uh, Internet uh, Wentworth. How does um, this place-based education affect teacher practices change? Um, there's there's a lot of um, if you look at the article that's in my references by Steve Semkin and others from 2017, the idea here is to engage with the place, to engage the students with the place, and to get the students um, thinking about and, and transferring their ideas from different kinds of media about the place. So one of the things that it does is it does lead to that more generative learning model that I shared and some of those practices that do lead to more student-centered learning where the students are making their own meaning of the place, but in positive ways through different techniques of recording and working with media. There's a lot written about, if you look up place-based education about how it um, affects teacher practice. So it is right at eight o'clock, by like at my time. <laughs> yes, it's sure uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's eight o'clock our time. <laughs> in, in, <laughs> Not in sure in uh, Are there any other questions or comments that anybody would like to make? 
can I just make, make one call? I, I really am uh, very pleased I, I was here moderating. Otherwise, I never get a chance to listen to talks like this. It was fantastic, Ed. Uh, obviously, in, in healthcare, uh, where I come from, virtual reality is a big, big area. So one of my, my problems have been is uh, virtual reality and those kind of experience and simulators are pretty expensive and not universally accessible. So how do we then use this kind of virtual, you know, before we can talk about real world context, how do you bring this virtual context to those who don't have access to that kind of technology? I mean, they have a smartphone, they do have maybe 3G or 4G, but how do we bring that without you know, all the uh, tools? So I, I'm not sure you can, Vi. I think that um, what you can do is, because they're going to have to have their hands on the tools at some point. Yeah. Um, but what you can do is you can get them to the point that they're comfortable with the tool. They know what it looks like. They know where the buttons are. They know how where the other people interacting are going to be standing or working or where the patient's going to be. Those things can all be done virtually so that when they do have those, op those rare opportunities or those uh, to, to work with the tools themselves, they're prepared to do it and get the most effect out of it in, a, in the most efficient and timely fashion. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, I think that's that's uh, useful. And I, I think one of the things about the assessment of learning is whether learning has really uh, have been uh, acquired by the learners. And uh, just one comment, I, I find that's very useful. How do I get into the brain of the learner, whether he has grasped the concepts. And I think um, one of the technology that's been used, which is basically a posting board, Trello, uh, brought the concept of the external brain. And I find that quite useful. I recently have been using Trello. It's free. So Trello can act both as an external brain, looking at the concepts that you have thought and how they are thinking. So it's a space. It's a space that they can use very safely and securely, and they can decide when they want to share. And the second thing is, I think it's also useful as you see the development of the learning occurring as an electronic portfolio of the artifacts uh, as they move towards the, at the end of the learning program. And, and it's there for life. And I think it's, a, it's one of the useful things. Just wanted to add that as a comment. Yeah, I think, Vi, one of the things that you said there that's really important is the externalizing of the, the, the new knowledge, getting students to somehow share it in a way that shows that they've learned something. And there are and a lot of what, what can be done is letting the students decide how to do that through the projects, through writing, through drawing, through different means, through programming, so that they can show what they've learned and how they externalize that so others can validate it, um, peers and instructors. Prof. Apta. Oh, my God, Ed, that was really wonderful. Thank you so much. I know you have spent a lot of time. It's, you got up early in the morning, you know, for this session. That's we were smart. just trying to see uh, the time, you know, always trying to get timing that is appropriate for people. But I think you sacrificed quite a lot in terms yeah. of your time. So uh, thank you again. But I also like to take this opportunity to thank our participants and all those wonderful questions that came from them, Mike, Raj, Samenu, Suat, Supriya, Gurdeep, Antonia, Diogues. Thank you all so much. I think these questions are worth uh, spending more time and we, we shall see how we can form, uh, if there is a way to form communities of practice around uh, place-based learning and instructional design and how do you connect places, uh, actual spaces with virtual uh, spaces. Uh, above all, I'd like to really thank Dr. Um, Dr. for taking his time out as well. He is uh, still holed up in a hotel in Singapore. <laughs> uh, prisoner uh, for, for another three quarantine days. quarantine, and, and, and it, again, he has taken time out to be with us. So I take this opportunity mostly to thank Jonathan, who is behind the scenes. Really, he has put in a lot of effort into this session and also the team, the marketing team from Asia Pacific University, Jerry and all, uh, you know, our huge thanks to all of you, Ming Ming, for helping us out in, in this event. And uh, I would like to thank everybody again. Thank you Ed, so much for your time <laughs> and uh, for this wonderful session uh, with all of us. 
with that, uh, we would like to end the session and uh, wishing all of you in the other part <laughs> a great day. And those on this Eastern block, uh, you know, time to have your dinners and maybe rest in. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you all very much for the opportunity and thank you to the audience for being so wonderful about participating. Really appreciate that opportunity. Thank you to Asia Pacific University and all there. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.